we're gonna talk about some of the mechanical aspects of the robot. With me, we have some steel components that we use to build robots. We have a plate, C channel, U channel, chassis rail, one hole bar, and angle bar. These make up the base components for every mechanical system on the robot. So let's say we wanted to put together a couple of pieces of metal. Let's show you how to do that. The process is really simple. We just line up the metal together, put our screw through, attach the nut to the other end, and start to tighten. You want to pick a screw size that's conducive to your environment. I'm using a larger screw size here to make it easier for you to see. In most cases, you want to have two screws through each piece of metal at minimum. For higher strain areas, use up to four. Now that I have the first one tightened by hand, we use our wrench to make sure that we have that last little bit and make sure it's not gonna go anywhere. Putting the screws in opposite corners will help to make sure that it's going to stay secure the best. This illustrates the use of putting the bolts in the opposite corners. This secures it from multiple directions and you have to make sure to really tighten down your nuts, otherwise it'll come loose from use. So now we have what could be the corner of some kind of lift mechanism going across our base. It could be a part of a base or any other mechanical part. The most important things to think about when you're building your robots is how it's gonna get around. We have a bunch of wheels with us today. Tank drives are a viable option, but in most cases wheels are gonna be more versatile. So we're gonna focus on the wheels. We have our higher traction wheels and our Omni wheels. Higher traction wheels are great whenever you don't need to be moving from side to side. The downside to using these wheels is that it's harder for your robot to turn. And when it does turn, it likely has more friction turning as opposed to our Omni wheels which have little to no side-to-side -side friction. When looking at the higher traction wheels, some things to keep in mind based on the sizes are, are you trying to get over certain obstacles? Does having a smaller wheel benefit you versus using a larger wheel? Most of the time when trying to move quicker, using a larger wheel will actually get you across the field faster. It's also generally easier to go over some obstacles when using larger wheels. The reason being, the motor spinning the inside is always gonna move at the same speed, but the further out you are, the more distance you cover in the same rotation. It's also generally easier to go over certain obstacles when using the larger wheels. Some other things to keep in mind, when trying to go over obstacles, the higher traction wheels are generally gonna be preferred. And that's because they have the same amount of grip going across the entire surface of your obstacle. When using the Omni wheels, the main benefit is that you will be able to turn smoother and faster. The Omni wheels only come in two different sizes. They're generally not used as much for trying to climb over obstacles. In most cases, your robot's gonna wanna have some combination of both high traction and Omni wheels. Most of the time, you're going to want to drive your high traction wheels and let the Omni wheels spin freely. When you're driving the high traction wheels, you generally want to let the Omni wheels spin freely because it's going to let them move as needed to reduce the amount of friction when turning. One thing to keep in mind though is if you're only driving your high traction wheels, your center of rotation is no longer the middle of the robot, but instead the middle point between your two driven wheels. So the reason we generally use tank treads rarely is because of their low mobility. They spin slower and the robots move slower. However, the benefit it is they are in most cases the most superior for climbing obstacles. That about covers it for the wheels. We're gonna talk about gears, gearboxes, and sprockets. This is driven by a gear ratio. We have our motor turning a large gear, which is each spinning two smaller gears. This is creating what is known as a speed gear ratio. When the motor is turning this larger gear, it is spinning at one speed, and because there's more teeth on here than the smaller gear, it's creating a ratio of speed. If we were to inverse this ratio and have the gear turning a smaller gear to a larger gear that creates what's called torque. Speed's pretty self-explanatory in that this is going to make the wheels turn faster, but they have less force behind them, which is what our torque is. If we were to have one gear ratio turning another gear ratio, that creates what's called a gear box, which allows you to compound these ratios to have even more speed or more torque than you would have just spinning two gears. So in this scenario, we're going to imagine spinning one gear or the other. If we have this 12 tooth gear and the 64 tooth gear, we're going to spin our 12 12 tooth gear with a motor, which is in turn going to turn our 64 tooth gear. This creates a torque ratio where 
the motor doesn't have to do a lot of work and the turning gear has a lot of force behind it. The ratio is 5.3 to one. Inversely, if we were to put the motor on this gear and turn this one, the motor is going to be under a lot more strain, but this gear will spin 5.3 times faster than if it was just the motor. The ratio of torque to speed is inverse. So the more torque we have in this system, the less speed we have in the system. All of the VEX gears have a standardized tooth pattern. What that means is that you'll be able to use most any VEX gear with any other VEX gear without having to worry about the meshing. Chain and sprocket function much the same way that gears do, except whereas gears need to mesh with each other, the sprockets mesh with the chain and then the chain moves the axis of rotation around to the other sprockets. It's often better to use sprockets if the motor is going to be far away from the thing you're trying to turn. Using multiple gears to achieve the same distance will create more friction in the system. The last part of what we're gonna talk about for the mechanical systems are bearings and collars. The bearing is this black bar right here. The collar is what's attached to the end of this axle. The bearing stabilizes an axle inside these square holes that the VEX material is made of. The collar prevents it from sliding in and out. So to help illustrate the importance of using bearings and collars on a system, we have one gear that has no collar and no bearing and one gear that has both collars and bearings. The one that has no collars and no bearings is able to freely move around within the square peg of the metal. Also with no collars, the axle is free to slide back and forth, creating a very unstable system. The gear that has a collar and bearings moves very little with a, even just a single attachment point. The collars also keep the gear and axle from sliding in and out of the system. So that wraps things up for the mechanical section. Uh, next, we're gonna move on to the electrical parts.